you know, percent of the units so I can get my money back. Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't, it's not liquid, right? Until they yes. sell all of the storage unit, mm -hmm. you're not going to get your money back besides whatever your percent of the profit is. You're not going to get your principal back. Okay. And so, or if you do oil. Hey, Jeff. It's nice to have you here in the show. And um, can you tell us what you do and how long have you been doing it? Sure. So um, I'm a financial planner, investment advisor. I have my own boutique firm called Guideline Capital Management. I've been in the investment advisory financial planning arena since 1999. Started straight out of school. Wouldn't recommend that for anybody, but did anyway. <laughs> um, went, went, from, went from the roaring 90s straight into the crash of the 2000s in like a six-month period of time. It was awesome. Uh, I got my CFP, uh, which is Certified Financial Planning designation, um, 2006, 2007, something like that. And uh, yeah, so I, I work with um, primarily accredited investors, which we'll talk about today, mm -hmm. um, which are pulled from uh, professionals, you know, doctors and engineers and uh, physicians and you know, sales executives, etc. And then business owners is kind of my two. Uh, sort of my bread and butter. And then I work with a lot of retirees. So uh, my job is I'm regulated just like an attorney or a CPA or a doctor as a fiduciary, uh, which which isn't necessarily uncommon, but it's not certainly the norm. Mm -hmm. um, and so my job is to do the best I can to minimize my clients' risks, maximize their opportunities, and hopefully give them significant peace of mind about their financial lives so they can you know focus on what really matters. That's great. So it's safe to say you've had a lot of experience. 25 years now. Okay. Yeah. Well, before we dive into our main topic, I want you to discuss the traditional investments. Okay. Because as for me, I only know like, well, maybe private equity and stocks, bonds. Okay. It's so like so the, the common. So private equity is not common. But it's I, not? I, no. So we'll get into that. Oh, but okay. So, so it's not common. So traditional. <laughs> so there's two. There's two broad, broad categories, right? There's oh, yeah. traditional investments and there's alternative investments. Mm -hmm. And alternative investments are, are, when you really think about it, a pretty lame name because all it means is they're an alternative to the traditional. Yeah. So traditional for the majority of investors mm -hmm. is cash instruments, things like money markets and CDs, f uh, fixed income investments, so things like bonds, and, and then the vehicles you get into them with, so bond funds, uh, individual bond bond funds or exchange traded funds that um, invest in bonds, and then of course there's the stock market, right? And so most people know about the stock market via mutual funds, either that's in their you know in their brokerage account or inside 401ks and so on and so forth. So they're most people's exposure to investments is usually the stock market, the bond market, right? Um, and then of course again banking instruments, cash, alternative investments. The simple answer is everything that's not that, right? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned private equity. Okay. So equity is just an uh, equity just means ownership, right? So so the stock market represents equity in different companies. So uh, another word for stock is equities. So private equity is companies that are owned uh, by individuals or partners, groups of people that do not trade publicly, meaning that are not listed on the stock market. They can't, you know. So for example, Apple. Right. If you want to buy Apple stock today, you just log into, you know, Fidelity or Schwab or uh -huh. where, where, wherever you have your account and you can or you call up your advisor and you just buy a share of Apple based on whatever it's trading at today. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you wanted to purchase, say, a, a, you know, I don't know, a piece of the Dallas Cowboys. Well, that's Jerry Jones's. And unless he wants to sell you a piece, you can't buy a piece. Right. So. Private equity is a, a kind of a catch-all name for owning a piece of a company that is that is held by a group of individuals or a group of, of small, closely held businesses. Um, I read a, a stat. This is pretty old, but I don't know, five, six years ago. 80%, roughly 80% of the companies that have over 499 employees, so 500 employees or more, are actually privately held companies. So if you're not invested in private equities by some via, by by some mechanism, you're you're missing out on 80% of the companies that have that are that, are that large, right? Mm -hmm. That have 
And I think a lot of people don't realize that. They don't realize how many companies are actually doing very, very well that aren't available to the average investor through the stock market. Other areas of alternative investments, things like private debt, obviously private equity, so you have private credit. Um, you have energy investments, you know, oil and gas. You have uh, commercial real estate, mm -hmm. whether that's you know office complexes or apartments or industrial warehouses, storage units. There's a whole host of financial instruments that are probably considered alternative investments for the average the average investor. So things like volatility hedge funds or uh, long short strategies or managed futures, anything that is uh, a little bit more of a derivative based um, investment. So there's a, there's a lot in there are a lot of the alternative, alternative world, yeah. right? There's a, there's a lot more alternatives. I mean, timber, raw land, mm -hmm. um, gosh, litigation finance. I mean, there's there's a tremendous amount of manners of, inv of, of investments and investment styles that don't fit the traditional stocks, bonds, cash paradigm. But what are the most common, if not most used Okay, so I would say what I see in in the alternative space that's probably the most used, and it's it's really because it's such a broad bucket, bucket but it's 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 really four, right? So there's there's private equity, mm -hmm. private credit, mm -hmm. energy, so so uh, whether that's things like um, oil and gas drilling, or sometimes there's things called master limited partnerships, which invest in stuff like pipelines and midstream oil and gas. So, so let me, let me back up. In oil and gas, you got to get out of the ground, right? So that's drilling. So you can invest in a drilling program. You can say, hey, I want to put money and I want to invest in oil and gas. And the reason why uh, someone might do that, besides just having a general bullish outlook on oil and gas, is there's some tremendous tax advantages that come along for the investors. Mm. So when you invest in an oil and gas drilling program, on average, you get to write off roughly – anywhere from, say, 75% to 90%, depending upon the particular program, 75% to 90% of what you put in. So let's say you have an investor who wants to invest $100,000. Roughly, let's just call it, let's put the difference to say 85 cents on the dollar that you invest, you get to write off against your ordinary income. So what that means is if you have someone making $300,000 a year, they invest $100,000 on oil and gas platform. As far as the Uncle Sam is concerned, you only made two hundred fifteen thousand dollars that year, not three hundred. So for for my clients that are that are high income earners mm -hmm. um, or or higher net worth individuals, you're looking at having a really significant benefit right off the bat. Because obviously, again, if you have three hundred thousand dollars of income, and all of a sudden you can say you have two hundred fifteen thousand of income, that's eighty five thousand dollars. You don't have to pay taxes on. Well, for most of my clients in that tax bracket, that's saving them, you know, thirty five grand. Yeah. Right. That's that's immediately like day one. And then, of course, you have the returns of actually owning a piece of the production. And so when oil is sold on the market, hopefully it's sold at a significant profit and you can, you know, maybe maybe but like most of the strategies I put my clients in, the average cost might be 30 to 40 dollars a barrel to get mm -hmm. the to get it out of the ground and to the marketplace. And so if you're selling it for 60 dollars a barrel, you're making a pretty nice profit. Right. So I, I kind of lost my train of thought there, but but oil, that's that's an example of, of mm -hmm. oil and gas investing. Yeah. Then there's ways where you can say, okay, well, I don't want to necessarily drill. I want to own sort of the pipelines that get the oil from the from the fields to the refineries, right? Get get the transport the, the actual oil. Well, that's kind of like owning the Dallas Tollway, right? Because it's it's when you own a pipeline, you literally get paid, you know, a a, a toll or a Every time a, a fixed like fee for the amount of, yeah. you know, petroleum that's flowing through your pipeline. So you get to just kind of tick off money every day just for how you, you put the infrastructure in place and it just sits there and makes money for you. Um, so so energy is – especially in Texas, energy is a big deal. Yeah. Private equity is any business mm -hmm. that you buy into that is not publicly traded. So not an Apple, not a Walmart – Right, that's a privately held company is mm -hmm. private equity. If you have a piece of the ownership, private credit is where groups will get together and raise capital, and they will lend to companies, and they will they will lend to 
private private companies, or sometimes even public companies, but usually private companies, because it's generally harder to borrow in a significant way when you're a smaller company or a mid-sized company than when you're a really large company. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole entire um, world of finance out there that you can access in the alternative space that funds um, businesses. So like, for example, there's um, a type of private credit uh, there's called BBC, so or BDC, excuse me, called which stands for Business Development Company. And what they would do is they lend money out to corporations that want to grow, and they f file a they they basically have a lien against the assets of the company. So I remember in uh, the financial crisis in 2008 2009, GM was, you know, the jokes were it was becoming Government Motors, and they were trying to file bankruptcy. Well. Most of the equipment in these in these GM plans, like like the actual assembly line equipment, mm -hmm. was purchased via financing arrangements where the equipment itself was collateral for the the money that GM borrowed, borrowed. Right. Mm -hmm. So when they wanted to file bankruptcy, the people that lent to them, which was uh, they were what's called senior secured debt. They were first in line to get mm -hmm. paid above everybody. They went to GM and said, well, you know, you, you can file bankruptcy, but what you're trying to do is file bankruptcy, restructure, and continue to operate. You're trying to continue to make cars and trucks, right? To do that, you need our equipment, and if you don't pay us, we're going to come in and we're going to take all of your equipment because it's really our equipment. Mm -hmm. So you can go through bankruptcy and you cannot pay us, but you won't have any tools to build cars with. So lo and behold, GM said, well, you know, we think. Look here, we actually found some money, and we can pay you guys for what we owe you, <laughs> right? So, um, interest, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting uh, little anecdote about the power of of being first in line to get paid. Um, so that's private. That's an example of private credit. And then, of course, the biggest asset class in the world is real estate, right? It's I mean, it's yeah. every it's everywhere. And I have clients invested in everything from apartment complexes to. Um, Solar panel arrays to storage units to in industrial – actually, one of the biggest ones in the last decade has been industrial warehouses as everybody sort of moved into the Amazon world of you know waking up every morning and there's a you know cardboard boxes on their front step because they ordered stuff and don't remember it. Um, you got to have places to store all that, right? Mm -hmm. So warehouses are a great, a great thing to invest in if they're managed properly. Uh, a, a company I really like uh, – I guess I shouldn't mention any specific names on on here for compliance reasons, but there's a company I like that does um, 5G towers and peep. So you know everybody talks about going to 5G for their their phones. Mm -hmm. Well, a 5G tower has about 300 percent the bandwidth of a 4G tower, so it can put three times the data through. But it only goes a third to half as far. I don't remember if it's a third or half, but let's just it doesn't go as far, but mm -hmm. it does a lot more, right? Which means Verizon and AT and T and you know Sprint, T Mobile, all these companies have to put up, or they have to have their equipment more. on a lot more towers. Yeah. So there are companies out there that will go around to all of these little strip shopping centers you see everywhere in suburbia, right? That's got the CVS next to the nail salon, next to the donut shop, next to the cell phone repair place, and they'll go to you know Therese, the you know landlord manager, or the owner of that, and say, hey, um, I want to put a, to a tower about yay high. And I want to stick it on your roof, and nobody will be able to see it from even the road. But and you're... I'm going to pay you five grand a month for that. Is that cool with you? And I want to do that. I'm going to give you a ten year lease. And you say, Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. It's just my roof. And then they turn around these folks that are doing this, and uh, they reach out to their contacts at AT and T and say, Hey, we've got a brand new tower at this intersection. You know, your your coverage here is weaker than your competitors. Would you like to? Would you like to? Uh, Put your equipment up here. Mm -hmm. And you go, well, sure. That sounds like a great idea. Cool. We're going to give you uh, a lease. It's going to be 10 years. We're going to give you 3% a year uh, escalation in, in costs. So it's like a rent raise uh, that's just going to be built in. And then you're going to provide the equipment. You're going to install the equipment. Mm -hmm. You're going to maintain the equipment. You're going to repair the equipment. And if you have to move it, you're going to disassemble the equipment. Matter of fact, all I'm really going to do is give you a key to Teresa's roof. Teresa's roof. Mm -hmm. And um, that seems like a pretty good business to me. And then they call Verizon and they call 
T-Mobile. You know, they just go around, hey, your competitor just added on. Would you like to be part of our tower? Because mm-hmm. you can put six or seven different companies on the same tower. Like oh. it's like a radio tower. So they just it's just scaffolding. And so what I like about that is an alternative investment and and we'll get into why diversification and correlation matter. But I think COVID proved we're not getting rid of our cell phones. We're not putting these things down. And uh, the reality is, is it doesn't matter who's president, elected president in November. You know, it doesn't matter if some jerk flies a plane into a building. Like as long as we are all using and paying our cell phone bills, my clients and those in that fund will get somewhere around a five and a half percent tax-free dividend. And, the, and it has historically appreciated around five to seven percent a year on top of that dividend. So you're talking wow. a, a 10 to 12 percent rate of return that while not risk-free – you know, I don't yes. want to like, dear SEC, not risk free, but in a pragmatic kind of realistic world, it's kind of hard to understand where there might be significant loss, right? Because everybody pays their cell phone bills. Mm-hmm. Data's just go, data usage is going up. Devices are just going up as far as the number of devices. Um, demand for data is just going up. So um, to me, that's a really smart piece of your pie, right? Arrow in your quiver. And what's great about it and what the goal is of almost all alternative investments are is it's uncorrelated, which means it doesn't move in lockstep with the stock markets or the bond markets. It's its its own beast, right? Mm-hmm. How it does is basically dependent upon that particular business and not a whole lot of other things, Yeah. right? So that's I, I, that was a really long-winded answer to a short question. <laughs> no, but that's very interesting. But I'm wondering, so whenever you, of course, like say for myself, I want to invest, I'm sure there's like minimum monetary requirement for a specific, you know, alternative investment methods that you would want to or you would um, suggest your client to take. Say, let's talk about there are big time investors and there are some some investors or potential investors that don't have a ton of cash to throw around. So what do you think are the specific alternative methods that they can use? Right. So let's to to clarify that, we'll kind of we got to draw some some kind of like delineate between different investors. So our government, for better or worse, I personally think this is. I understand why they do this, but I don't like it. They have created a definition. There's a couple definitions. The first one is called an accredited investor. So there's regular folk, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's an accredited investor. An accredited investor, generally speaking, there's some other nuances that that, that play into this. But for most people, you have to be worth over a million dollars net worth. Actually, I think it's a million one now. I think they changed it last year. But at least a million dollars net worth, not counting your house. Mm -hmm. Or... $200,000 $200,000 of income for an individual or $300,000 of income for a married couple. So if you, you can so you can qualify just based on the income, mm. you can qualify based on your net worth, or you can qualify on both. If you're an accredited investor, you can now do a lot of – almost everything I mentioned, there's at least a version of it you can do. You can do private equity. You can do private debt. You can do oil and gas drilling. The reason the government put that in place is they are trying to avoid – somebody with less than honorable intentions or maybe somebody that's just not very good at what they do going to you know sweet grandma lily down the street who only has $25,000 to her name taking all of it investing to you know yeah some some high risk you know we're going to we're going to flip this house and then of course that's the last house anybody ever buys before real estate crashes and she loses all of her money mm-hmm. right they're trying to avoid that kind of risk and the pri- and here's but here's what you have to really realize the primary risk they're avoiding, and this is pretty common for most of these investments, most alternative investments, not all, certainly not um, hedge funds like managed futures and, and, and hedge funds that use a lot of um, derivatives and options are more liquid. They can be more liquid. But if you put money into building the storage units, right? So let's say you put money, say you put $100,000 into a storage unit that costs 50, you know, $5 million to build. Mm. Right, so you own one, what is it, one fiftieth of that. You can't call up, you know, John, the storage unit, storage, storage unit, storage unit operator, and say, "Hey, you know, something's come up. I need my money back. Can you sell one point six, you know, percent of the unit so I can get my money back?" Mm-hmm. Like that doesn't, it's not liquid, right? Until they yes. sell all of the storage unit, mm-hmm. you're not going to get your money back. Besides, whatever your percent of the profit is, you're not going to get your principal back. Okay. And so, or if you do oil and gas drilling, once they 
you know, drill the well and sink the uh, – they're taking your money and they're buying pipe with it, right? They're buying drill bits. They're buying – they're paying foremen and they're not – you know, and, and, and well hands. They're not – they're not roughnecks. They're not – like the money's not sitting in a checking account. Yeah. So once you give it to them, your return comes from the business working successfully. It doesn't come from – it you know being sitting somewhere and you can just go trade and get your money back like kind of like stocks right stocks go up you can just sell your stock the next day for more money and get your ideally and get your money back if you want to that doesn't work for alternative investments so they're very very illiquid that's the biggest liquidity risk is the biggest kind of hurdle well a lot of people can't nest don't necessarily the idea behind the government's limit is they presume erroneously in my opinion but they presume that people that make a certain amount of income or have a certain amount of assets can afford to take that risk, that it's not a big deal if some of their money's tied up. The reality is, though, I've had clients that have significantly less income than that that are great savers and have paid off their house and they're in a great position and they'd be great investors in these strategies. And I've had other clients that make a million dollars a year and they spend every single dime and they can't afford to invest at all. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a baby and bathwater thing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's accredited investors. The next level up, and something called a qualified client, which is $2.1 million in net worth. And the last level up is what's called a qualified purchaser. If you're a qualified purchaser, you can invest anywhere on, in anything in the world, assuming the people you're trying to invest with want you to, to be to, your partner, yeah. right? But as far as the government's concerned, you can. If you're not an accredited investor, so if you don't have a million one of net worth or 300000 of income if you're a married couple, um, there's still things you can do. But it gets a little bit more complicated as far as the diversification and correlation aspect. When I mentioned uh, the the cell phone tower yeah. strategy, for example, and I said, hey, it doesn't matter who's president. It doesn't matter what happens to interest rates tomorrow, right? Because it's it's illiquid. It's it's going to pay you what it's going to pay you, and they're eventually going to sell the tower, the, 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 the lease rights to the towers in three, four, five years to somebody else. But it's pretty insulated. But if you own – Let's say um, a mutual fund that invests in real estate, right? Or a mutual fund that invests in private equity because this exists, or a mutual fund that invests in private credit or energy. It's tempting to say, "Oh, well, there's my diversification." I, you know, and by the way, just I assume our audience knows, but they might not. Um, I prefer usually to mutual funds. I usually prefer what's called exchange traded funds. Um, those are just baskets of stocks or baskets of bonds. They're they're less expensive ways of getting the same exposure. But whether we're talking about ETFs or mutual funds, I'm just going to say mutual funds going forward to keep it simple for folks. You would think, okay, well, if I have a mutual fund that's invested in real estate and I have a mutual fund that's invested in energy and I have a mutual fund that's invested in stocks and I have a mutual fund that, that's invested in bond, that's very diversified, right? Mm -hmm. Because after all, the mutual fund invested in real estate is owns a bunch of real estate. So you don't necessarily need to invest in different kinds of investment to be called like a diver to, to have like a well, diverse so, portfolio. So that's what I'm getting at is in that scenario, they're all mutual funds. So in that mm -hmm. sense, they're all the same. Yeah. But they're in the underlying assets are different. So you do get some diversification there because real estate's going to behave differently than um, than you know private credit, which is going to behave differently than the stock market, like the S&P 500. Where this falls apart, where this is really frustrating as an advisor and as investors is generally speaking when people really care about diversification is when things are getting rough, when things are risky like 2008 right, or 2022, right? Mm. So in 2022, stocks went down 20 percent. Bonds went down 20 percent. Well, usually bonds and stocks don't necessarily move. They're not usually correlated, but they happen to be that year. The challenge with using traditional investment vehicles like mutual funds or exchange traded funds to invest in alternative investments is that in times of crisis, the correlations go to one is what we call it, which means when when everybody's panicking. So let's say um, to use this uh, – I'm trying to think of something that, that, that – like when – Kim Jong Un's really threatening. I'm about to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna bomb somebody. Right? He's he's rattling saber like he did when Trump was in office. The markets in general tend to sell off. Well, people stop looking at their fund as I have a mutual fund that invests in real estate, and whatever Kim Jong Un does, as long, as long as he doesn't actually start World War III, it's not going to affect my real estate. Mm -hmm. So my real estate value hasn't gone down. 
Well, true. But if I have the mutual fund and you have the mutual fund and our good friend Taylor has the mutual fund and y'all panic, you hit the panic button and you sell that day, the mutual fund manager has to sell those shares to give you your money back. Mm -hmm. So even though I didn't sell, my investment, at least in this very short term, goes down in value because people stop valuing the fund for what the underlying investment is worth and they start valuing it as, well, I better sell before three sells. I better sell before Taylor sells. So everyone just raced. So what happens first. is when things are liquid, people, what ends up happening is you can look at kind of in normal times and the private equity fund acts different than the real estate fund, which acts different than the stock fund. But when people panic, they all go down. They mm -hmm. tend to, not always, but mm -hmm. they often move in the same direction. So one of the biggest drawbacks or risks to traditional alter – to, to alternative investments – I said like, it's confusing, traditional alternative investments, but to the way alternative investments have historically been invested in, which is through direct private investments that are illiquid. Yes, it's a risk in the sense that if you need to get your money out, it's hard to do, mm -hmm. right? If, it, if it's premature to the investment – if the investment's not mature yet, right? Yeah. I'm going to invest with three. She's going to put a bunch of money in a bunch of apartment complexes, and the plan is you're going to flip those or you're going to sell those apartment complexes to a large institution in three to five years. Well, if it's eight months down the road and I come back to you and go, I want my money back, that's a challenge. I can't really get my money out. However, that, that risk of me not getting my money out when I want to becomes a protection when I'm invested and everybody else wants to bail because they can't bail either, mm. right? Mm -hmm. They just got to kind of stay the course. So one of the – I do think everybody should look at alternative investments as a, as a piece of their portfolio. But I will say in my experience, it has not worked as well for those that don't reach that accredited investor threshold because they're having to come in through vehicles that are very liquid. And so it can, it can sort of shake people out of it, right? They can get kind of scared out of the investment. So they get discouraged because you can't withdraw just when you want it. Correct. Well, no, well, no, no. Rather, because because if you invest in mutual funds, mm -hmm. you can withdraw whenever mm -hmm. you want. When other people start doing that in mass, it it lowers, it, affects, it makes your price yeah. go down. So a really good way to think about this is a lot of people panicking in in, in 08, right? When when the market just, I mean, the, the stock market went down from October of 2007 to March of 2009. It went down 52 percent, which is wow. pretty stunning, right? Um, the Nasdaq went down even more. The S&P 500 went down 52%, which is a lot of days with a lot of red. People kind of panicked about that. Well, at the same time, it probably would have been hard to sell your house, but you didn't wake – but every morning you could wake up and – I don't – I guess maybe not – cell phones were barely – smartphones were barely around back then. But we could – you get on your laptop and you could check the stock market instantaneously. But when you left your house to go to work, Nobody was there giving you an up-to-date, mm. hey, if you need to sell your house by the end of the day, it's, le it's worth 20% less than it was last week. N you know, you didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I guess Zillow is around now, but you didn't, you didn't know that then, right? You had a sense that probably not a good time to sell, but people weren't having the emotional impact of, on Monday, your house was worth $380,000, and now it's only worth two seventy. dollars And then next week, oh, it's back to three twenty, dollars And the week after that, oh, crap, now it's two fifty. dollars I mean, they didn't see it because they weren't trying to sell their house in a fire sale by the end of the day. Market prices are what could you sell it for right now, yeah. right? So when things get tough in the markets, it gets painful to watch. I just want to clarify. So you say mutual funds you can withdraw. Other alternative investment methods – you can't withdraw or they've – maybe they've found a way around it that they can still withdraw whenever they want Well, to. so so that's a great question. So generally speaking – so again, if, if I – if you and I decided to buy a rental house together mm -hmm. and I came in with half the money and we have a rental – we have a, a leaser in there, a leasey, lease, lease – I don't know, Leasy. whatever. We got somebody written, right? And our goal originally when we did that was to, to, to rent it for five years and sell it. Yeah. The only way I can get my money out early is if you buy me out, right? Mm. But you don't have the ability to do that. But if I invest in a mutual fund that's through an institution that invests in tens of thousands of, of houses, they by regulation have to keep a certain amount of money just in cash so people can redeem and can get money out. And, you know, there's, so they just there's, buy them yeah, out. yeah, they just, the institution will buy them out and basically buy that share for them. Or, or, or if, if, if not the institution, 
you know, basically there's always buyers and sellers. There's the idea being there's an investor coming in that day that wants to buy and I want to sell. So it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. um, however, the marketplace eventually recognizes these things. So there's something called interval funds. And so kind of the, the newest, I don't know if it's the newest, but one of the newer twists in this marketplace is the biggest complaint, especially from, you know, kind of the mass affluent investor, kind of the, 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 you know, the regular person we all are, mm -hmm. right, was, okay, I want to have investments in oil and gas and in storage units and in, you know, apartment complexes and whatever else, private equity, private debt. But I don't really want to be super tied up in case I need to get to it. So there now are something called interval funds where you put your money in, you're diversified across 10, 15, 20 different, maybe that's a little bit high, so six, 10, 12 different uh, investment sleeves. But the institution will, will, will say, you know, barring some kind of massive emergency, excuse me, massive emergency, you know, some kind of crazy financial calamity, we will allow up to 5% redemptions, you know, per quarter or per month. So it's like liquid on a monthly basis. So what mm -hmm. it does is it kind of keeps people from panic. Oh, oh gosh, the market's down on a Thursday. I'm going to sell. Because you have to usually put your money, you have to put your request in usually like 30 to 60 days ahead of time. So it's kind of a, a forced sort of line, if you will, like they're, like you're queuing up to get out. Yeah. So it, it gets rid of sort of that panic selling, but it still provides liquidity to investors. And I think that, and that's a win-win. One, it gives investors, you never know, right? People have emergencies, people get laid off. A little off. bit of cushion. You, know, you, get, you get a little bit of safe peace of mind knowing, yeah. okay, I can get to my money if I have to. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, the institution, the benefit of the institution is, well, we have to be a little more liquid than we like, but there's a whole class of investors that may not have ever considered giving us money for five years and not be able to touch it that might go, okay, well, our plan is we're going to work really hard for you for the next five years, but if you need to touch it, you can. That that opens up a whole new segment of the investing class, the, the investment classes that, that would not touch it otherwise. So I do think net-net, that's a good idea. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but if I say, for example, me, I want to invest, what do you think are the f initial steps that I want to do, would want to do? In alternative investments or investing in general? Alternative investment. So I think, you know, it, obviously it's a very personal question because it depends upon your resources mm -hmm. and your goals and all of that. Say an average Joe or um, a first-time investor. So a first-time investor, you know, you're still going to want – Probably, and I mean, again, I'm cast, this is a really broad brush, but you're still going to want to have, you know, significant exposure to, to, the, to the stock market mm -hmm. because that's, that's been, you know, the greatest wealth creation tool of mankind, like of all history. But um, I would say, you know, maybe look at it and say, okay, I'm going to take 20% of my portfolio or 30% of my portfolio and, and target – these alternative investments. And then within that, I want to divide that up probably in, so let's say it's 25% for easy. Mm -hmm. I might do 5% chunks, right? Find an ETF for mutual fund that does private equity. Find an ETF for mutual fund that does private credit. Find an ETF for mutual fund that does real estate. Find one that does energy. And I'm not really sure what the last one is because I ran out of examples. Real but, estate? Well, I said real commercial real estate, but I do think, so okay. my point is there's, there's ways, I mean, that's how I would do that, but you don't want to overload into any one segment. I mean, the whole idea behind this is that you have, I call it errors in the quiver, right? You, you, want, as, you want as many quality investments as you can, as you can that are as unrelated to one another as possible. Because that way, if something, so for example, if you own Apple and Google and Microsoft, mm -hmm. right, in significant percentages, and there is a legislation that comes out because we get freaked out by AI and that, that, that puts a big damper on AI development. Or maybe it really starts taxing AI in a very significant way. Mm -hmm. Well, if, it's, if it hurts Microsoft, it's going to hurt Google. And if it hurts Google, it's going to hurt Microsoft, right? Generally speaking. What you're looking for, whereas if, if something hurts Microsoft, it's not going to hurt waste management, right, that picks up your trash. So that's the idea of diversification within the market-based things. You want the same idea with alternatives. You want, you want again, if oil prices crash, well, that's really going to that's really going to affect your energy play. But it shouldn't affect too much your commercial real estate play, Yeah. right? So, and then, of course, 
the idea of rebalancing comes in. So, the, you know, if you have a year where you just kill it in oil and gas, and let's say, so I had like a really good year in 2020 in oil and gas for my clients, 2020, 2021, because COVID had really dampened the demand. And so, you know, not only the price of oil go down, I mean, in April of 2020 went negative, but not only the, not only the price of oil go down, but then all of this, all of the contingent industries that related to that. So like the, the oil and gas fracking you know, sub industry contractors and the the pipeline operators and you know the equipment leasers, like all of those guys were giving you a lot better deal in the fall of 2020 and, and 2021 than they do than they do now because mm-hmm. they still wanted to work, mm-hmm. right? So like, well, and you know, so if I'm if I'm an oil and gas producer and I'm going, well, gee, you know, three, so we we'd love to hire you to 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 frack our wells, but we can't pay what we paid you last time because mm-hmm. oil's not at eighty dollars a barrel; it's at thirty or forty, and so you come down on your price. Well, that was a great time for me to invest into oil and gas for my clients. If oil hits $100 a barrel, which is funny when – the one thing that's really strange, right? In everything else people buy, the lower the price, the better, generally speaking, right? Mm -hmm. I mean like so if you want to go buy a brand new car and and, and you call them up and say, well, hey, you know, if you come in today, it's going to be, you know, 50 grand. But hey, if you come in over Memorial Day weekend, I can knock another five grand off. You're not like, no, I want to pay the 50. I don't want 45. I want 50. But in investments, the more it goes up – the better. more people want to talk about it, mm. right? People don't want to when, – when Bitcoin's going down, people don't want to buy. They want to sell. When Bitcoin's going up, they want to buy. But yet it's getting more and more expensive. Because they expect for it to right, keep the, going. Right, because, yes, they think uh, it's going to keep going, yeah. the greater fool theory, all this other stuff. So my point being is I'll have a ton of people talk to me about oil and gas when it hits $85 a barrel. Nobody wants to talk to me about when it's 40 But just intuition would tell you if long-term oil is average 60 or $70 a barrel – you're a lot better buying in when it's at 40 than you are when it's at 85, mm-hmm. right? So one of the things that I try to do is make sure that that we take the, the the current and probable future macroeconomic environment into play when we're making these decisions of where we put our money now. So if you have a year where you crush it in oil and gas and you're making a lot of cash flow, maybe you should take that mm-hmm. and buy real estate this next year or mm-hmm. buy private credit or I mean you don't need to the idea of rebalancing taking your winners and then re-diversifying across other high quality investments but in more opportunity buying is is the way you want to do it. All right, Jeff, I have a question for you. Oh, oh. we yeah. have Taylor here. Hey, He's Taylor. not in the camera, but my question for you oh. is people especially when they don't have very many assets, they want a home run. Yes. And even when they have a lot of assets, they want a home run. But yes, yeah. Uh, but if you have a lot of assets, you're more worried you're about conserving. You know, you don't want to lose what you have. Right. So yeah. you're 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 going to be more, you know, wise about how you invest your money. But the problem is, or really for you, where is this these alternative investments? Where's the home run so that someone can get rich quick? <laughs> I mean, I could tell you that, but I have to kill you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, well, that's the thing is I don't I don't think there really are. I mean, so I have another business. It's litigation. It's called litigation finance, and that that backs litigation, and that's a type of alternative investment. So if somebody's company A is embroiled in very expensive litigation with company B, and we think a lot of times company A is a successful company but smaller, and company B is a monster. Mm-hmm. Um, so I won't I won't impugn anybody, but let let let's say you know if it's big tech giant company against say a smaller engineering company that designed a product for them, yeah, and then they violated that contract, you know we were gonna we we told you we were gonna pay you all of this and then we decided to just change our minds and they break contract. A lot of times, little guys like, well, that's not right. I got a contract, and the big guy goes, yeah, you do, but you know, take this money and go away. But this money and go this money's. Nothing Not anywhere compared, compared to what you promised me. Yeah, but it's going to take you three years and four million dollars to fight us in court. You sure you want to do that? And you got then you might not win. Uh-huh. So th- that kind of, I mean, it's it's obviously not said quite so crassly, but that kind of legal posturing happens all over the country or all, all, in business, all over the world, really, right? And so in, li- in litigation finance, as an example, you can back, you can go to those companies and say, hey, we will we will provide the financing for you to to, to hire the best attorneys, and when you win. We're going to get a piece of your pie. Mm. Well, that strategy has averaged, you know, uh, industry industry wide. It's it's averaged north of thirty percent for the winners. Um, now, if you lose, you lose. But for the winners over the last decade, I, I mean, but it's it's ve- it's very uh, it's unknown to almost every investor if you're not an institution. So what you're basically saying is, in the alternative investment world, it's very different 
what you're going for. So like if you're going oil and gas, you're you know what you're going to get. It's pretty much going to be what it historically has been, but there are other types of alternative investments that are more risky. Oh yes. So so I was just yeah, I was just trying to lay the line but I was giving that example of that that might be great, but but where, where where's the opportunity? Well, the opportunity is it's significant double digit returns every year potentially over the long run. But those returns are oh, we won the case in year 4. Mm-hmm. And we got so much money that it was the equivalent of 30% a year for four years. But you don't know who you're for, right? So that's a risk there. On the flip side, you mentioned you know, oil and gas. You do, you do, do know more about oil and gas, but like a, a really good example of high risk, super high reward, but rare is venture capital, right? So the idea of like the, all of these startup tech companies in Silicon Valley at one point in time, right? I think I read that Peter Thiel – made his billions on like five companies, but he invested in like a thousand. Now, some a lot of them made money and made a little bit of money back, but a whole lot of them just crashed and burned. But the few that didn't, right? If you get in for 50 cents for every share mm-hmm. and it turns into the next Facebook, that's a, that's a pretty, or PayPal or whatever, that's a, that's a pretty big deal. So when it comes to your question about home runs though, um, I think a rule of thumb is, you're going to have to give up something somewhere. And so if you want, for example, if you want to know how much money you're going to make and have no risk of losing it, that's a CD, right? Mm. That's good. You, you're not going to lose any money. You know what you're going to get, but it's not going to be very much. If you want the opportunity to make good money historically, but have it be liquid, that's the stock market. But you could have, And you can have years like 2023 when the market's up 24%. Or, t- or 2019 where it's up 26%. Or you're going to have years like 2022 where it's down 20 or years like 08 where it's down 38 or segments like 2000 to 2002 where it's down 83%. The, the NASDAQ, which everybody loves, right? The NASDAQ's got all the tech stocks. That was down 83% from March of 2000 to the end of 2002. That's brutal. So, and then you have things like venture capital where, hey, it's really likely you're not going to make money. But if you do make money, you mm-hmm. might make a lot of money. A lot of money. So everything's got its place, right? Everything's uh-huh. got its trade-offs. So where do you think um, financial planners come in? How early do you want to have like financial advisors? I think it's it's as soon as you have, as soon as you've done more than, um, if, so assuming you're an employee, right? Assuming mm-hmm. you're just kind of a traditional employee. Once you've gotten several months savings. And you are doing your 401k plan. If you have a 401k plan, you're doing that at least to the match. Mm. It's worth having at least a conversation with a financial Mm. planner, right? But it really depends on what you can save, where you are. Um, You know, I certainly want to see people – you really don't want to get too close to retirement before having a pretty significant conversation with a financial planner because things like tax planning and social security optimization and estate planning really matter at that point. But for someone like yourself that's – young and has her whole future in front of her, save as much as you can. Um, but I do get people, you know, just because you talk to a financial planner doesn't mean you invest with them, right? I mean, so for a lot of people, I'll tell them, just open an account on Fidelity and here's a kind of a, give them like a little prescription, if you will. Here's, here's the five or six funds I would invest in. Nice, low cost. They're not paying an ongoing fee. It's a very inexpensive way to build, build wealth. And they don't really need my services in a full sense yet. Mm. I have one question for Taylor. As an estate planning attorney, how important is it to work with financial your clients' financial advisors to align, you know, the goals of estate planning and financial planning? Well, if, if the actual financial planner does actual financial planning, then it's very important. And the reason why is one, you got to get everything set up. But the whole point of usually doing estate planning is you want to leave something to somebody at some point or protect yourself in a long term care situation. And so somebody who knows what they're doing in the financial planning world can help you actually put that together. The problem is a lot of people call themselves financial advisors, but really what they are is investment advisors. They just want to invest Mm. the money. It's true. And they don't want to actually work with you and try to figure out a plan and put it together and try to execute that and meet with you. They'd rather go golfing and take your assets and and, uh, have somebody else in the back end you know, doing do it the, for them. Do it for them. But I want to hand this off to Jeff really quick. 
a book I didn't write. <laughs> <laughs> The reason, you you could have written. <laughs> the yeah. reason, you could have written. <laughs> the reason I want you to hold that up so everybody else can see that was, <laughs> I've known you for thirteen years, and yeah. I read, I've read half the book so far. But for thirteen years, you've been talking about all the things in this book, and you kept saying you were going to write this book. I know. And Tony Robbins beat you to it. But look at that jawline. I don't have that jawline. Yeah. Look at that. And no one would have bought your book. So no, one, is... no one would have bought my book. Who's this guy? I would buy it. Oh, great. One yeah. sale. Yeah. <laughs> no one. one. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, my book's in front of both of you guys. You both haven't read it yet. <laughs> I've, I've heard listened, about it. I've listened to it. <laughs> yeah. I've Some heard... of it. Some of it. See, it's exactly. A book. See, no one will read your book. So, but anyway, just to show that you're not full of crap, that Tony Robbins. Went out and interviewed, I think it's something like 20 different billionaires. Mm. And this is what they do. Yeah. They yeah. Do. They do. And so uh, if you think that Jeff didn't, if you just watch this and you don't think Jeff knew what he was talking about, go pick up Tony Robbins' book. It's called The Holy Grail of Investing. And you can go through. And <laughs> Free I'll tell you, ads. Yeah. Go give the super rich guy more money. <laughs> exactly. No, it's okay. Like, like he, he deserves it. He actually went and he got the people to actually say this is how you actually invest and you don't lose. And Tony Robbins talks about in the book, like he, he wishes that it was open to everybody to be mm. able to do. And the House tra is trying to pass laws to allow more people to do accred accredited investing. And so hopefully that can happen for certain people. It, it is. I will say that kind of – I know we got to finish up. But I will say that there's more opportunity now to invest in to invest in alternative investments than there ever has been before. It's much more democratic than it mm -hmm. used to be. Literally when I got in the business, like if you could not write a $100,000 check or higher and often higher. You can't. You, you just couldn't. You just, mm -hmm. it, wasn't even, it didn't even exist for you. It wasn't uh -huh. something that was – was available. No, that's why because I was listening to this and I think I got through maybe like chapter seven and I I saw how it is f so focused on big time investors and I, I was curious whether there are some, you know, alternatives to. There are and we can, I can get you more information on that. And, and then we will talk this. about that on our next there podcast. There we go. We will Fair have enough. to have a part two on this one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we also should have started off with the, that, the, the fact <laughs> that people can go out and read that book to understand what you're trying to talk about is that these ideas have been around for a long time. It's what very successful people use. And also sometimes these funds can be home runs for people, but usually they're not. They're just, as, as Robbins puts in the book, they're very good at diversifying right. an actual reality. They zig when the market zags, usually. Not always. That's the goal, though. Well, we are going to wrap this up. And thank you, Jeff, for all your knowledge. And I hope our listeners learned a few insights about alternative investing. All right, cool. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you.